Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Beyond Trade Podcast. I'm your host, Leo Dalton, and today we are going to do a New Year special. So it's going to be kind of an informal podcast. Uh, it's just me today. Uh, we're going to go over a few things. I um, guess we can get right into the agenda for today. We'll talk about a little, little check-in, right? Well, we're going to talk about the podcast so far, my thoughts on that, and you know, feedback that I received and uh, we'll move into some highlights of the podcast, you know, things that I liked and just things that really stood out to me because, you know, every podcast that we I've recorded so far, they've been pretty unique so far. And, and I love that. And, and I know it can be a lot switching topics every week. And, um, I kind of enjoy it cause I tend to move pretty quick through topics. Um, and I cycle through them. So I'll cycle back. <laughs> That's just kind of how my mind works. But podcast is good too because I kind of focus for a good week on the topic and and I can kind of really delve into it so yeah we're gonna go over some highlights just some thoughts that I've had on on the podcast so far on that on some episodes maybe specifically and I'm gonna go over some books I read uh I'll bring out my favorite ones um and I want to talk about some goals too it's new year so it's a good time to talk about goals we're gonna talk about the podcast goals and maybe we'll even touch on some personal goals so I got some notes here with me. I, I don't have a presentation for you guys, so it's just me and my face. And <laughs> I hope you guys enjoy this episode. So it's very informal, but yeah, starting to we'll, right, we'll get right into it with the check-in. So, you know, podcast in my mind has been going absolutely amazing. I'm extremely happy with it. You guys have been amazing, um, giving me great feedback. I mean, the gro- the growth is great. I love it, and um, it seems that. We're attracting a good a good group of people who are really interested in this topic, and and that's kind of what I wanted, right? It's not about getting famous or anything like that. It's more about just getting the word out and um, talking with people who are open. Because at the end of the day, like you know, I'm not changing anybody's minds. It's people are coming to their own conclusions, and and that's what's really important to understand. It's you know, I'm not out here trying to change people's minds. I'm I'm kind of just presenting information. Obviously, I have my own opinions and things like that. Everybody's got opinions, right? So. But uh, nevertheless, right, it's, it's important to understand that, um, that you know, I, and that's what I try to preach because, you know, I try to tell, you know, try to say that, you know, we're all sovereigns. We all come to our own conclusions and we're all capable of coming to our own conclusions, right? There, there may be a learning process involved in trying to understand logic and, and how to decipher what is true. But even the way that you look at the truth depends on the person, right? Some people look at good, bad. Some people look at true, false. So. And, and that's a really important thing to distinguish too, right? Because not everybody's going to look at life through the same lens. So, you know, I definitely attract like-minded people. That's a given. But um, I've had some conversations with people who've, who've never heard of, you know, the train paradigm or, or anything related to the train. And they've been super interested. And, in, you know, these people are not, you know, well-versed in this topic, but it's come to light, right? It's just, the information's out there and people are, are hopping on, right? They just... Uh, it's something to consider at least, right? It, it doesn't matter if you fully agree with it or not. The, the the way that you get there matters less than the goal too, right? Like, so if you're leading a healthier life, you know, a truly healthier life, you know, where you're, where you're minimizing toxicities and increasing nutrients, you know, it doesn't matter how you get there. In my mind, it's it's a matter of if you're feeling good, if you know, you live a long life, if you're moving well, if you're achieving your goals, right? So that's the real important part here. And so I think that's super important. That's super important. But, you know, I love that. I love the conversation that I've had a lot of people like disagree, right? And and I think that's great because when people disagree, like this is where growth happens, right? And it can be uncomfortable and it can be quite confrontational, but, it, you know, it's all about respect too at the end of the day. Like, you know, there, and obviously there's always disrespect present, right? And it, it happens, right? Especially in the social media field, people are, are tall on social media. So it's something you got to kind of look past. And, but a lot of people are, are extremely interested, right? And, and even though they may not agree, they're just, they're very interested in, in hearing the perspective. And so at the end of the day, that's, that's where a real good discussion comes from my mind. Obviously two people who agree on something have a great discussion and, you know, like definitely on the podcast, I've had like-minded people on. And, and I think that's really important too, right? Because we're kind of pushing things forward and digging deeper and getting some good quality information out there. So 
that plays a role. But I do love the idea of talking with people that disagree with you because I think this is fundamentally where science uh, flourishes, right? It's it's in disagreement. You know, there's also the idea that there's no reason why everyone has to agree with each other, right? <laughs> people are obsessed with making other people agree with them. And I think that's kind of foolish and a waste of energy too, because like at the end of the day, like there's nothing I can do to change anyone else's way of life too. Right. And you know, you can even, you can know this information and not act on it. That's, it's still, <laughs> you know, that's something that I still work on. Right. We can always get better in this area where, you know, you, you learn about how to minimize toxicity or increase nutrients and, you know, different things like this, and even in the paradigm here, like, but then implementing these things, like grounding every day, like, you know, it's cold out, and it's not really you know, snow on the ground, <laughs> like going out and grounding is pretty uncomfortable, but it's something you got to, you got to work on too, right, got to do more, and this partly part of my personal goals moving forward is consistency, and, you know, and that's, that's a goal that's, that's pretty good for everybody in my mind, because we're not perfect either. But yeah, I mean, getting back to it, like, you know, there's, there's nothing anyone else can do for you, right? Everything comes from within. And that's, that's something that I've really learned over this past year. And I'm going to expand on more going forward. You know, there's no one out there out there that can save you. And there's nothing out there that can save you. You know, everything really does come from within. And this may sound a little woo woo preachy, but it's like, it's, fundamentally very very true your mindset is so important if you're reluctant if you're fighting something that you know arguably makes you better objectively just the fact that you're fighting it is going to be problematic it's going to cause there's going to be a disconnect there there's going to be a wall so so i think that's really important too right and i think a lot of people just get obsessed with this idea that everyone has to agree with each other and i just think that's so counterproductive I think if people disagree with you, I think that's fine. Problems do arise when, you know, you can't have a respectful conversation, you know? So like, I, I don't want to put anyone down who disagrees with me, but I would certainly love to have a conversation because not only does that, you know, give them a different perspective, but it gives you a different perspective too, right? Like if you can understand the other side of an argument, this is the best way to, to move forward, Right getting this criticism, getting this con this criticism back to you, this constructive criticism is going to just help your ideas flourish and solidify them, right? If you're, if you really think you're on the path to truth, nothing can question that, right? If you think that you got to hit the nail on the head with what you know, you should be able to take on absolutely anything because you're sure in your truth. And guess what? If you take, if you <laughs> listen to somebody who challenges your ideas and you think, oh, these guys might be correct. Well, then you're only getting closer to the truth, too. So this is comes into being open-minded, right? And obviously, this is super important, being open-minded. But yeah, I think you should be able to talk to people you disagree with. Now, a lot of people are reluctant to this idea. Like, they don't want to necessarily change their way of thinking. Because we get stuck. We get A lot of people get stuck in, in their ways of thinking. It's something that I certainly want to avoid moving forward through my whole life, right? And it happens worse with age, I think. You don't want to get stuck, right? You want to remain open-minded. Closed-mindedness is problematic. That's when you become fixed, and that's when growth stops. That's that's what inhibits growth, a closed mindset. An open mindset is conducive only to growth. It's good to always remain open-minded. But, yeah, I, I, I definitely, um, you know, I want to keep moving forward, and, and I want to talk to people on the other side of the spectrum this year. Um, but it can be challenging challenge people don't want to they don't want to open up or they don't even want to have the conversation because they don't want to change their mind right they're closed-minded and and this is a problem in the scientific field because you know you're working in a lab and you're working for a company who is funding you and they have a certain opinion right and you need to meet these their goals right you need to meet the the people who are funding you you need to meet their goals because if you don't meet their goals you're not gonna they're not gonna publish the study first of all and they're not going to rehire you, right? So if you're working for a supplement company or drug company, if you're not proving that the drug or supplement is doing what the company wants it to do, you know, or if, if there's no positive benefits to it, right, that study's not getting published. So 
it can be difficult for scientists especially to get out of the out of their dogmatic ways of thinking especially they've been taught the same thing for a very very long time right from from primary school right you know you're learning in science class all of these dogmatic ideas that are set in stone and it just gets worse and worse as you go when you do university and you know everything you're just told that everything's a fact when when um there's definitely a lot left to know right we we don't know quite a lot so that's really important i think to distinguish and but yeah it's important to understand that uh people are reluctant to change they don't want to change and and it's understandable and yeah in the scientific field you see it they don't want to change because obviously they have their funding and they have their their ways of thinking so there's a couple avenues that really that really inhibit this and and that's tough and tr trying to break through that is is difficult and like like I said, like I, I really want to talk about people that I that disagree with me. It's been challenging so far to find find people who are truly open to the conversation, right? Because it's also no fun to have a conversation where you know you're being talked down to the whole time, being talked to like you're an idiot. When you know it's like you know I'm just trying to bring valuable points to the table here, and so it's that's no fun, right? Nobody wants to really go through that, and and if push comes to shove, you know it it is what it is, but. Yeah, I mean, I think that that would be super cool to talk to people who disagree with because I've loved it. Honestly, the comments have been fantastic. You know, people bring up great points. They bring up fantastic points. And so I guess we're going to kind of move into some feedback that I received. I got three major points, really, that 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 come up. And I guess we could get into one more that's kind of specific to more parasites. Uh, that was a big, big one. Um, but yeah, so a great a great piece of feedback I received was that viruses have been, were discovered before electron microscopy. And I thought this was super, super interesting because we, we talked about it briefly. We talked about it briefly. So um, I believe his name was Ivanovsky who discovered it and it was the tobacco mosaic virus. And he discovered the, the virus because he f essentially in essence here, um, I, I don't want to straw man the argument here, but, uh, for the purpose of the conversation, I might a little bit, uh, but look into it for sure. Look into his process, but I'll do my best here. I'll do my best. The tobacco mosaic virus, you notice tobacco plants were getting diseased, right? So he took the fluid from the tobacco plant and he created a filter, right? And so he filtered out anything that was too large. This would be like microbes, right? So the idea at the time was that uh, microbes could cause disease. This was coming to the to the front, but viruses weren't very well known. So, you know, he he created this filter to get rid of he got rid of the microbes, and so what would pass through the filter would be smaller than microbes, and so essentially he tried to inoculate this into other tobacco plants, and they. Uh, were diseased was his this was his body of work right so his findings were essentially that something smaller than a bacteria or you know a larger microbe is capable of causing disease and so they named this you know whatever this biological agent I suppose they they were predicting uh, a virus now viruses interestingly enough have been around for a long time the word virus derived in lat from Latin actually means poison. So the idea of a virus has been around for a long time. And so I, I just find this distinction so interesting, right? When you look at the etymology of it, how, how it, it, it's a poison, right? So it's smaller than a micro. So, you know, my, my thoughts on this immediately are like, well, what's in this filtrate? You know, what's in, what is in the, the liquid that has been filtered, right? Because you have everything smaller than a microorganism. Well, guess what? Poisons, chemicals, biological or artificial, whatever it may have been at the time, is present. You know, obviously maybe some, e even some proteins would get through, right? Because a protein is much smaller than a, a microorganism. So, but that was obviously my, the big caveat with that work, right? So, the filtration process is obviously different back in the day, back in 
that time than it is now, right? Because now they kind of use these, you know, they may use um, globulins or antibodies to uh, try and bind virus, trying to, you know, they use different solvents to try and really isolate viral particles alone. And they may use two different types of filters where they filter out the smaller stuff and they filter out the bigger stuff. So you're kind of left with things on one size scale. So there's different techniques that they use now to isolate the virus. But obviously, the you know, we already went over the problems in isolating the virus. And I guess I can go over it briefly here. That obviously, the the isolated virus, right, isolated through the filtration process, may be a decent isolation. It may be a decent isolation. I'm not going to lie. But the problem arises in where they need to to go to produce disease using this virus, right? So they can't take the virus off the filter. They can't take the pure virus and produce disease in a person. That's never, ever, ever, ever happened. And they, the argument is that there's not enough virus to produce disease. I'll get back to that. But they grow it in a, in a culture, right? So they put it on viral cells and they treat it with antibiotics. Uh, so the viral cells are, are kidney cells and antibiotics are obviously toxic to kidneys. Uh, and they produce um, more virus. And then so they take that, which obviously there's more than just antibiotics in the uh, in this culture, right? But in the growth medium. And, and they try and produce disease with that. But now it's contaminated, right? So there's a ton of contaminations in it. So it's not pure virus anymore. So so it's interesting, right? You have the old way of filtration and you have the new way of filtration, right? And and so one was not isolation. So there was no isolation done. And the other one is, the, you know, you, we could try to isolate it to the best of our abilities, but then we actually need to recontaminate it to produce disease in both of these, right? So um, in both cases, contaminations are present. Uh, there's never been a true isolation of a virus. The other idea is that viruses are only visualized in the lab. And now I guess we're kind of getting away from the criticism itself, but but viruses are a laboratory artifact, right? They're they're observed in lab, and they're not observed in nature. And so that's a that's a major, major distinction as well, right? So uh, you know, the electron microscopy process in itself is problematic, right? And so this brings me to a next great point of feedback. Uh, somebody brought up electron microscopy. They brought up the two different types of electron microscopy. So there's a scanning electron microscopy and there's a transmission electron microscopy. So basically, I'll call it SEM for the scanning. Uh, that essentially creates an image where they deflect electrons off. They deflect it off of a physical phenomenon, right? Say like, you know, they visualize the the eyes of bugs or insects, right? Insects, not microbes. <laughs> so, and essentially the electrons bounce off it and that's how they get their image, right? So it's a black and white image of a, of a, um, of a, of a, you know, of a um, sample, right? But the difference is in a transmissive electron microscope, this pa this passes electrons through the actual sample to create an image. So the scanning electron microscope is actually quite interesting and produces you know fair images, right? You can look at the really close up images of insects and things, but it's on a much larger scale than what you're getting at with the transmissive um, electron microscope. So it's really two different topics. Now, the setup process involved in a scanning electron microscope is similar, but you're looking at very different structures. You're looking at larger structures, right? You're looking at, you know, you're looking at crystallized structures as well, right? So, but the idea here, and this is interesting, this is my idea, and this is my own criticism of, you know, maybe a Hillman mindset, is that. And it, and it takes an alchemical lens, right? As above, so below. So if we're crystallizing these insects, if we're crystallizing these larger samples and we're doing the scanning electron microscope where it's bouncing off the image to gather an image, is it producing something similar to the transmissive 
electron microscope, right? Now, this is this is challenging, right? Because if you freeze if you freeze a sample, it should freeze in its place, right? But the difference too here is that you're getting the whole you're you're freezing something whole in scanning electron microscope in SEM. So you're freezing the whole insect and you may add some um, heavy metal stain to it or something of the matter. Um, but you're freezing it whole. Whereas when you're doing it with cells in transmi transmissive electron, TEM, you know, you're cutting a slice of it, right? So it's not like the whole cell is being visualized here. So you're cutting a slice of it. You're freezing it. Sorry, you, you, you would cut the slice at the end. So you're freezing it, you're dehydrating, you're adding its stains. Now, the problem with this too is that you're changing the chemistry of, I'm answering my own criticism here too, you're changing the criticism, you're changing the, the chemistry of the cell. So when you change the chemistry of the cell, when you're changing the, when you're changing the chemical makeup of it, you're right, you're adding foreign chemicals into it, like these heavy metal stains, which we know are destructive to cells. We know they bear a completely different um, electrical properties, right? So you're changing the entropy. You're changing the order of the cell. This is super problematic. You're not only doing that with the freezing. You're doing that with the chemicals, right? So you're doing that. You're, you're adding these, these chemicals to it. So you're changing the properties of the cell. And so the cell is going to act out in this manner, right? Whereas when you're freezing something whole, like if I cut my hand off and I put it in the freezer, well, it's going to still look like my hand, right? But, like, if I'm going to put, if I'm going to add a bunch of chemicals to my hand and all this stuff, maybe the structure does remain the same. Maybe the structure does remain the same. But if you take my hand, you add chemicals to it, and you do all this process, and you cut a slice out of my hand, right, it gets a little more complicated. So scanning electron, I think, I think basically what the conclusion I'm coming to here is that Scanning electron microscopy and transmissive electron microscopy are different different topics. I don't think that you could compare them directly because one, you're bouncing off, right? If you were to isolate an organelle, if you were to isolate a Golgi apparatus or a endoplasmic reticulum and you were able to use a scanning electron microscopy process um, where to visualize the exterior um, structure of it, you know, that may be something to talk about. I don't believe that's ever been done because they use transmissive electron microscopy, which introduces a whole plethora of problems, right? When it comes to angles, when it comes to this. And so you're cutting the, you're cutting these slivers of, of the sample because it has to be super thin to get the electrons through it. I just think this is causing a plethora of problems, right? And this is what Hillman was getting at, even in the problem with angles, right? And so if you're also, if you're cutting like if you're cutting small thin samples, it should look different with every sample, right? So if you're cutting a sample of my hand and you cut it in between my pinky finger and, and my ring finger, well, the hand's going to look a lot different than if you cut it in the center of my middle finger, right? Because this is going to be very long and you're going to get a very different image. The interesting thing is when we're visualizing these Golgi apparatus and these um, endoplasmic reticulums, you're getting extremely similar images every time, right? And so that's another criticism. Uh, we covered that briefly in the podcast there where we were talking about Harold Hillman and his work, because that was one of his greatest criticisms. How does the Golgi apparatus show up time and time again in the same, it's the same image. And so you could throw that question right back, right? And so it's like, how does the same image come up every time, right? How does that make sense, right? Because you're looking at this endoplasmic reticulum that's it's it's all shriveled up like a raisin, you know. This is you you should get different slices every time. You should get different images every time. However, similar images are coming up. So that's food for thought. You know, and I think the other inch like the the thing about TEM, you know, the dehydration of its cells are so hydrated, right? If you were to dehydrate my hand, it would not look necessarily the same as it does now, too, right? So that's another thing with SEM. I wonder what the dehydration um, has to do with it because I think they're really, they're using, they're doing it on small, like you see the SEM pictures, right? You see them as insects and, right? So it's, 
it's it's very small it's very small but it's it's not as small as a cell it's not as small as a cell and so that's a that's a really important distinguish like um it's very important thing to distinguish, right? It's very different, different topic. SEM is interesting, right? I, I don't think it's necessarily problematic. I don't know what it really tells us, right? You know, you can look at, you can look at these small structures. And so you can get into the, to, you know, visualizing proteins and visualizing these things. And it's another interesting thing um, as well that we could probably get into a little more. I, I did take one course on the process of like NMR and uh, uh, X-ray crystallography, which were both really interesting in the way that they visualize the protein structures. But even with our advancements in in science and using these techniques, NMR and um, X-ray crystallography, you know how we're visualizing chemicals, right? You know NMR does quite well, and I, and I do I do love NMR. And I, and I think that's really, it's a nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, um, you know, so, you know, you're looking at, at the, at the basis and I don't really have a philosophical argument, uh, against the chemistry behind it and the physics used behind it because it gets quite mathematics and it's, uh, mathematical and it's, um, in its workings and, uh, it's a lot of graphs and, and things like that. It's quite a complex topic. So honestly, I struggled with the course when I was studying, um, how they use these tools to visualize it and how we actually, um, come to the conclusions we come to, but they seem quite good, but regardless, right. You're looking at crystals. You're looking at these, well, sorry, not NMR, but in X-ray crystallography for proteins, you're looking at crystallized proteins, right? So we know about, you know, we know quite a bit about the primary and secondary and the maybe even a little bit of the tertiary structures and proteins, right? Which the primary is the amino acid sequence. We know that secondary structures like uh, beta sheets or alpha helixes or things like this, we, we can visualize quite well as well. So we're understanding these, these properties, right? And we understand these, we understand porphyrins for the most part. We understand these things, but we don't understand entire workings of proteins, right? We don't understand quaternary structure right which is where um the tertiary structures i suppose would be how the protein folds up together and then the quaternary structures actually have proteins integrate with each other because you have things like heme which would be like four um similar structures come together right so we we know little about tertiary we know very little about quaternary structures of protein so even with these beautiful pictures and graphs right because it's all it's all cgi it's all computer generated there's only so much you can draw from these images as well right like it's like at what point is this not helpful right it gets to a point where it's not helpful and at this point it's not something that we should stop exploring per se because it's very interesting i love it but it's just at this point we don't know enough for it to be helpful so should we stop looking into it probably not i mean it's a, it's an area that you can look into i mean um, obviously with the caveat of understanding that, you know, you're looking at a crystal, you're looking at these frozen structures, you're not looking at live states. And so that's an important distinction. Is a protein that's crystallized the same as a protein that is, you know, alive in the body? Well, that's hard to say. Some proteins can be crystallized and frozen and after they're thought out, they can still be used. So they're still the structure is similar enough that after it's frozen, uh, you could still use the protein. So that's an interesting point. And so that's why I don't necessarily think that stuff like x-ray crystallography is, is useless. And NMR seems to be um, fairly useful and in its purpose, right, into in the visualization of chemicals, right? And um, but the the way science moves is, is the way the funding is where the funding is at, right? So the funding largely comes from pharmaceutical companies. And that's the way that science is moving, right? You know, we're visualizing chemicals. It's a lot of pharmacology. It's a lot of, you know, producing chemicals to create drugs or even supplements or um, industrialization obviously has a large thing. So we use plastics or we use, uh, you know, chemicals for fragrances and things like that all to our demise. That's, that's just an important thing. Um, 
and it, and it's a big topic and it's complicated and and kind of disputing it is is complicated as well because it gets if you're going to get down to the nitty gritty it gets really technical right because it's really mathematics it's calculus it's like it's all these big scary topics that are kind of boring honestly <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I do love the study of mathematics. I'm not well versed enough in it. I think it's something that I'll get to in later in life because I find it really interesting. I think it is the language of the universe. I love I love mathematics. I just at this point I don't have the time to really get into it. Right, I'm looking at it, things through a different lens right now. But that's a project for later life. <laughs> Anyways, I digress. Another piece of feedback that is kind of reoccurring, right? So what we're trying to get at here is looking at the root cause, right? We are concerned with the root cause. So here's the rationale behind looking for the root cause. You want to look at the area in which things stem from. And so correcting the area in which things stem from is the way to is the way to ameliorate to heal everything down the line. Right? So if you have a chain reaction of dominoes, well, if you hit the first one, everything down the line goes, right? If you hit in the middle, everything before is untouched. So it's the same, and, and if you look at it through the chemical pathways of a metabolism of classical biochemistry, if you're addressing things like uh, glycolysis, well, if you're adding in glucose, which is the first product of glycolysis, you know, that's going to that's going to change the entire metabolic process. But if you're adding in something halfway through, that's only going to change the processes downwards. It's not going to necessarily change going back. Now, it can have effects of going backwards in kind of an indirect way. Right, because if you're lowering a certain metabolite down the path, it changes the um, thermodynamics of the entire sequence. Right, so it's kind of a delicate process that if you do interfere halfway through a metabolic process, this will it could deplete a protein halfway down the line, or it could utilize up that protein halfway down the line, which may require more magnesium or more more of a mineral up the line or down the line. So, so it's it's rather complicated, right? But getting to the root cause of things beyond this classical way of looking at the biochemistry, because the biochemistry really is is so complex, right? Because it's because we've made it complicated. First of all, that's the most important thing to distinguish. We've just made biochemistry complex. Because life in itself is not necessarily complex, we've just overcomplicated it. But when you're looking at the biochemistry of things, you know, you have this, you have to look at it from its basis as well, right? You need to look at it from the chemical standpoint, and you need to look at it from the physical standpoint, from the physics of it, and then you could even look at it from the mathematics. If you're going to overcomplicate things, you got to take it all the way back, right? You've got to take it to its root. And as above, so below here, when you're looking at the root cause of a disease, you want to look at what started it, right? Because if a disease is caused by a toxicity, right? Say it's caused by heavy metal, and you're consuming this heavy metal every day, say it's through cosmetics, say it's through uh, breathing in chemtrails or breathing in uh, car fumes, uh, you know, even say you have a glass at home that has a nice design on it, a nice gla a drinking glass that has a nice design on it, and there's lead in the paint, and it rubs off on your hands, and you're slowly absorbing it through your skin, you know, you're getting this intake of heavy metal. So, there's two ways that you want to go about it. You want to get rid of the lead. In, I guess you want to get rid of the lead in two different ways. You want to get rid of the source of the lead, and you want to allow your body to excrete the lead. You want to detoxify the lead, right? You want to detoxify the chemical. So there's the two ways of looking at it, right? You obviously want to cut it off from the source because you could do all the detox you want, but if you're just going to keep replenishing your toxicities, you know. The detox will help. I I will say it will help because you you might not build up as much of deep chemical. It might not store as much deep in your tissues, but nevertheless, you want to cut it off at source, right? So I think it's really important to address the root cause. Now, say you have a heavy metal toxicity and a parasite is present. 
cleaning up, biotransforming these chemicals, these heavy metals, into a way that the body is able to detox it. Or, you know, maybe consuming it and then, you know, there's a lot we don't know about parasites and what they do. But we do know that they are in the presence of heavy metals. That's something that's been coming to light here recently, too. So I think this is interesting. And we'll use it as a little example, right? So if the parasite is there and you have the heavy metals, it's important to, to remove the heavy metals. Because that's the parasite's food. It's the parasite's environment. Everything in life adapts to its environment. Except humans, humans can create their environments, which is a little important distinction. However, biological or like beings, and even our cells, our cells don't necessarily create conditions, only our consciousness does, right? So biological organisms adapt to the conditions, right? Because adaptation is how we is how we reach this homeostasis, right? So the parasite adapts to the environment, right? And the pleomorphic cycle suggests that parasites can actually be grown within us, and we don't necessarily catch parasites. Um, although that topic's not necessarily absurd, so long as the parasite's being consumed with the heavy metal. Um, say you're eating a farmed fish, it's full of toxins and chemicals, and it's full of parasites as well. Well, consuming that fish obviously is going to burden your stomach with the chemicals and heavy metals as well as the parasite, which is there cleaning up the mess. So then, you know, you may have the presence of a parasite after that, but you still need to look at the root, right? You still need to look at the food source. You need to look at the environment of the being, of the biological organism, right? So you want to address the root cause. You want to get rid of the heavy metal. You want to get rid of it in your body, right? Now, there's a couple ways to get rid of heavy metals in the body. It's like you can, there are detoxification processes that you can help along, right? Our bodies are quite good at detoxification. It's what they do well. That's pretty much the whole process of disease is our body detoxifying itself. You obviously want to cut it off at the source. So why are you consuming these heavy metals? But when you are diseased, right, this is one of the pieces of feedback that I get is like, okay, you're overloaded with parasites. Well, at what point is it good to get rid of the parasites to allow yourself to detoxify properly? Well, my argument is, is that the parasites are part of the detoxification process. It may hurt, it may suck, it may be uncomfortable. That's life. Being sick is not necessarily enjoyable, right? It's not necessarily something you enjoy, right? It's not comfortable, but comfort is a poison in itself. So you, it, it's uncomfortable. And I'll say that. And, you know, the overburdened body of a biological organism, say a parasite, it is a distinction of a diseased environment. So my, you know, general take on this is that you shouldn't get rid of the parasite because it's there for a purpose. It's adapted to your internal environment. Parasite does not show up. The term parasite is a misnomer. The fact that it just is consuming your body and giving you no benefit, I don't think that's seen in nature. But we'll call them parasites for the purpose of the conversation. So you're looking at you want to look at the root cause and see. So you want to get rid of the parasite's environment. Now, the reason that you should not target the parasite is that because if you target its environment, once the parasite has no food source left, the parasite will disperse on its own. It will pass on its own, right? Whether you pat, whether it dies, whether it passes, whether it, whether it goes back to the microzyme, right? There's likely a few different ways that you could get rid of a parasite. And maybe the purpose of a parasite is to overburden itself with heavy metals for itself to be passed, right? This is another idea that I want to look at. So maybe there is a time when a parasite is overburdened with the heavy metals, that it is, there is a time for it to pass. But again, there's likely distinctions in parasites and their reason for being there. There's likely heavy metal parasites. There's likely, um, you know, uh, say you consume food and you don't chew it enough. There's likely parasites there to consume the food and break it down for your body to absorb it, right? So there's different classes of parasites as well that we need to look at. So there's heavy metals, there's un under chewed food, right? Whole foods in the digestive tract. Uh, there may be buildup in the gut, right? There may be a 
improper mucous membrane of the gut. There may be lodged, you know, food sources, tarry substances or mucousy substances that are over that are that are overstored in the gut that are unable to be absorbed, right? Maybe they're devoid of nutrients, maybe they're pure, maybe they've crystallized, maybe they've, you know, there's there's many different ways or you know, maybe they're they're too dense. Maybe they're too dense for the gut to absorb. So there's a lot of different ideas on why a parasite may show up, right? So and same with a fungus too, right? But you want to really address the root, right? And so, you know, there are some natural ways, right? Like raw cheese, unsalted cheese is a great digestive aid, right? Because it chelates minerals. Now there there's cases of our ancestors consuming clays. And even this is seen in the animal world where some monkeys consume clay and clay can act as a binder, a chelator as well, where it binds things in the gut and helps move it through. Uh, things like diatomaceous earth or bentonite clay are good ones. You know, these are more on the natural front. Now there's things like zeolites, which are seen in nature. And I quite enjoy zeolites, especially in the world that we live in today. Because we are overburdened by toxicity, it's hard to avoid the aluminum raining down on us from jet engines. Uh, it's hard to avoid the cadmium coming out of car engines, uh, unless you're really living in the middle of nowhere. But then again, a plane might fly by every now and again. You might get a little source of aluminum or heavy metals, right? So I do like zeolites. Funny enough, I actually have uh, a brand here, Touchstone Essentials, that I used before. I do want to touch on zeolites more. Uh, because I do think they are a, a good tool in the modern world where we are overburdened by heavy metals. But yeah, it's all about getting to the root cause of things. There there are real, you know, there are things that you could do like an enema, right? And this is a this is a rather rigorous detox, right? So it may not be for everyone. It may be kind of harsh. And then again, harsh is not necessarily bad, uh, but it can certainly be overdone. So it's important to look at that. But the point that I get at is, is that you want to address the root cause, right? You want to look at the first thing in the line. What is the source of the problem? Where does it all come from? And that's why the terrain model works so well, because you're looking at the terrain. You're looking at the environment of the organisms of everything, right? So it's beyond the organisms, right? And I just think that addressing the organisms is not addressing the the source of the problem, right? So when you're addressing the organisms, this is down the line from the source. So you could get rid of the organisms all day, but the toxicity persists. And this is the problem. This is where the problem occurs. It's the same as when you address the symptoms. The symptoms, again, are a signification of disease. And they're also a healing process, right? So getting rid of your symptoms, you know, decreasing your fever, decreasing your inflammation, decreasing all of these things is not actually addressing the root cause, the root toxicities or deficiencies. That's another thing that I want to talk about more, deficiencies. And we'll touch on it here. So I guess uh, we'll move into um, just some things that kind of stood out to me. Uh, you know, we started off, we talked to um, a couple guys there on on who were, you know, living a truly primal way of life consuming raw meat and I think that's a really important thing now I don't eat a fully raw meat diet I incorporate raw foods into my diet and it's helped me immensely right you know I've been asked you know do you need to go full raw things like this to be healthy and in a way maybe <laughs> but you know you know we live in a world like like the modern world, it requires balance, you know, and I think that in consuming raw foods, I think it is a very healthy thing. I think it does help our bodies a lot. I think it is the, the way, right? But I think a little bit of enjoyment in eating a nice, you know, seared steak, <laughs> what's your problem with that, right? Now, when you're cooking food, right? This has been something I've been thinking about a lot. You do decrease the nutrients, and that's important to understand, right? 
it's important to understand that you do decrease the nutrients. The beauty of eating animal foods is that you can eat them rare. You can eat the medium rare. And this may help in not decreasing the nutrients as much as when you char the shit out of your steak. Now, it decreases. There's two, two types of nutrients, right? There's fat-soluble and there's water-soluble. Now, the fat-soluble may take damage. They might take damage in the heating process. And the water-soluble are going to be dispersed, right? They're going to evaporate because they're water-soluble. Take away their environment, take away the water, and the water-soluble, for the most part, is going to disappear. Some will stay lodged, but most of it's going to be gone. So now, if you're eating cooked foods, I think salt is important. This is something that I've talked to my buddy about, uh, something I've been thinking about a lot recently. You see a lot in the primal community, the raw primal community, that they don't consume salt. This is something Ajin has talked about, that that salt is antibiotic, it's not good for you. I think if you're eating fully raw, you don't need salt. But once you cook your food, I think salt is important. I really do. And this is something, you know, I could change my mind on. Obviously, you want to consume high-quality salt. I think a sea salt is the best. Sun-dried is also best. Uh, it needs to be a little bit wet, the salt. You don't want it to be fully dried. You want it to be a little wet. So that retains a lot of the nutrients as well, like the trace minerals. Because I do think that you're losing some of those trace minerals when you're in the cooking process. Now, something like a stew or a soup, right? These pot meals, when you are, you know, you may lose a little bit of the of the water-soluble nutrients in the process. And you may degrade some of the fat-soluble, you know. For the most part, I think that it, the water soluble is leaching out into the broth too, right? So, you know, when you're talking about food, it's a little different. You're, you know, should we eat all of our food fried? I, I don't think so. Uh, if even if it's fried in tallow, albeit a better source of frying is tallow or butter. But definitely things like soups and stews and these hearty meals are definitely up there in in being really good for you too. So I think it's an important distinction, right? Uh, do I think fully raw is necessary? Not necessarily. I don't. And I'm going to say for a couple of reasons. You know, unless your goal is to maybe live to be 200 years old, <laughs> you know, when you're eating raw meat, raw everything from birth, that may be possible. I don't know. I don't know. But there's a lot of people out there who live to be 100 years old in great shape and they don't eat raw meat, right? Some of them even say that they drink Dr. Pepper every day. Right? Some of these people have weird habits. These centenarians, they have these weird habits, right? That, you know, you're not seeing across the population, right? It, it may even be seen as unhealthy. Now, my thing is, is if one person can do it, anyone can do it. So if there's somebody that lives to be 120 years old and they don't eat any raw food, well, then. It's a difficult argument to say that raw food is absolutely necessary to live that long, right? And longevity, I suppose, in my mind, is a good indication of health, right? But longevity also in health, right? You want to be as healthy as possible for as long as possible. So if you live to be 100, but you're diseased to hell and you can't walk and you got to poop in a diaper, that's not health to me. That's not worth it, right? You know, I want to be able to sit down and stand up get up off the ground until I die. I don't want to be in a home. I don't want to be, I want to be able to go out for walks. This is my longevity, right? So there's ways of looking at it, right? Meat in my mind, generally this, I can't deny the idea that meat is absolutely necessary. Cooked or raw, whatever, you need to eat meat. Does it need to be red meat from cow? No, not necessarily. Can it be fish? Yeah, Weston A. Price observed people who ate fish. Can it be rodents? Yes, he did that as well, right? Doesn't necessarily have to be cow. Doesn't have to be uh, red meat, right? A lot of people demonize chicken. Yeah, the chicken industry is shit, and so is the pig industry. But these are not inherently bad when raised properly. So if you're getting a good source, I don't see a problem with it, right? Like, this is, this is nature, right? It's part of nature. Weston A. Price didn't observe everyone eating big red meat, big game. That that wasn't his observations, right? A lot of people ate mostly fish, right? Now, is fish overburdened with toxicities now? Perhaps. Perhaps they are, right? Especially freshwater fish. Freshwater streams are fairly polluted now, as well as the sea, 
with microplastics, but I really don't think that avoiding fish is going to decrease your microplastic intake that much, right? The water, every all the water in the world, if it's in a spring, right? If it's in a well, it's likely got microplastics in it. So I don't necessarily think that you're avoiding um, you're avoiding microplastics or necessarily toxicities by avoiding fish. Uh, and that's one thing that I do like about the primal movement, right? Is that they are consuming more than just red meat, right? That's the carnivore movement. I hate that. Like, it's like you can only eat red meat every day for the rest of your life. I don't agree with that. I think all animals fine, right? It's, it's the quality that really matters. The quality matters. And now the interesting thing about eating it raw is that you may actually absorb less of the toxicity. So eating fish, I love to eat fish raw. That's the best way to eat fish. Do I love a nice barbecued sea bass in the summertime? Of course. Do I like some barbecue mackerel? Yeah, I do. But eating it raw is very, very beneficial because you're not absorbing as much heavy metals and likely other toxicities as well. This was something Adjutus von der Plants proved with his studies on cats and oh, maybe it was dogs, but regardless, yeah, eating it raw is beneficial. So well, everybody loves sushi. So, you know, there's no problem there. But definitely consuming animal products is necessary. Could you eat bugs? I, I don't know. I'm not some, uh, you know, Bill Gates bot out here saying to eat bugs. But, uh, you know, there are some traditional meals that insect-based, right? Ant pie is one, right? I think that's an African dish. You know, maybe they stemmed out of um, starvation. Maybe, right? Same as the overconsumption of grains, maybe that comes out of starvation or the overconsumption of potatoes. Maybe that's because of starvation, but in a decent quantity, these things aren't going to be problematic. Right. And there is a, an idea that diversity is good in, in a diet, right? Eating a diverse range of things. You're not just going to eat one thing. You're not going to eat one. You're not going to just eat cow, right? Eating only one thing. I don't think that's going to bring about the best way forward. But then again, here's the thing. If one person can do it, anyone can do it. We're more than diet. It's more than just what you consume physically as food, right? It's much more than that, right? It's much more than that. I think that's the most important distinction that that I can make. And if you notice, every episode I ask the guests what, what health means to them, not once has it just been eat good food, right? It's always more than that. It's being connected to nature. It's being you know, it's living, right? It's all about living. It's all about, it's more than just that. You got to have your mind, right? You got to have your spirit, right? You got to have all these things right beyond. You got to have family connections, community, um, purpose, you know, meaning. So that's very, very important. It's more than just diet. It's more than just what you consume. You know, a diet is more than what you consume in itself, right? It's what you consume through the screens. It's what you consume when you walk down the street, who you're talking to, who you're surrounded by. So it's always more than just what you consume through food. So is food even the most important thing for longevity? No. There's even an argument that fasting is good for longevity. <clears throat> and obviously a lot of people in the carnivore community, and there's kind of this new movement that fasting is not good. I'm not on board with that completely. Now, is fasting good when you're young? I would argue against that. You know, I've done a few fasts so far. It's been challenging, right? You know, I'm still fairly young and, you know, I'm still pretty skinny too, right? But I think it fasting benefits you more in later in life, you know, learning to learning to control your temptation and food and controlling this gluttony, I think comes later in life and I think there is a benefit to that, right? And it's beyond it's beyond what you're consuming, right? It's it's the mental benefits because really mentality is everything, right? I think longevity, I think the best key to longevity is focusing on living. You know, if you're focused on dying, you're going to die quick. But focus on living, you'll be all right, right? If you think that death is inevitable, you'll live forever. If you think death is, is coming, you know, if you think it's coming, it's going to come. <laughs> so don't focus on it. It also doesn't matter because when it's your time, it's your time. So anyways, we will <laughs> we'll move on from there. Yeah, I love the chat on alchemy. Alchemy is something I love. I want to get into it more. 
Phoenix Aurelius was a fantastic guest. I recorded an episode with him. It's not out yet. I'll let you guys know when that comes out uh, for his podcast. That was a fantastic episode. So much fun. I love the guy. He's so fun to talk to. We drive really well. He really opened up my mind to the alchemical transformation of knowing, right? How the splitting of the fields is an alchemical process. This has been my favorite, favorite thing to focus on lately. So we split the fields and how now is a time where it's all coming back together is the alchemical transformation. And I just love that perspective as it resonated so deeply with me. It's actually now a goal of mine over the you know long term is to be able to integrate everything together to take all of these fields, right? Because all of these fields are so separate and the people working in them are so narrow minded, right? For the most part bringing them back together, we're going to get a really cool perspective or really, I think we're going to get really close to the truth too. And so I just love that. I love that episode. I want to have Phoenix on again in the future. He was so fun to talk to. Mm -hmm. Have you written on my episode with Ryan Alexander talking about nutritional deficiencies? Now, there's also this new movement that I want to delve into further and in that there are no uh, diseases caused by deficiencies. And I do want to look into this further. You know, Ryan gives a really great, really great argument for the the fact that there are nutritional deficiencies. It's a great argument. Now, I think there's two ways of going about this, right? You know, taking the average Joe and giving them supplements in this day and age, I really think is a helpful thing, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you've supplemented, if you've done that, if you're in good general, generally in good health, is supplementation going to be your friend? I don't think so. I think I think there are levels to it, right? You need to move on from supplementation at some point, right? You don't want to rely on supplements, right? You want to start sourcing better food. You want to start, start looking at the energy in your food. You want to start looking at practices beyond what you're consuming. You know, you want to start looking at consuming structured water. You want to start grounding. You want to start getting your light health in order. You want to start sleeping better. Um, you want to start lowering EMFs. Uh, and so I think this is something important to focus on. But Ryan's feedback speaks for itself, and I think that's really important. And so generally, getting into health, you know, he works with a lot of people with chronic illnesses, right? For the most part, people with illnesses, right? And so there's a difference between an acute illness and a chronic illness, right? Something that's reoccurring. If it's reoccurring like like a lot and it's constant. Well, you're getting into something that's in a later stage of disease. So maybe correcting the nu nutrition is important. And so the way that he looks at it is that they're giving more than the body necessarily needs to overload the body with nutrients so the body can rebuild itself in, in its way, right? In its proper way. And so essentially the body has the nutrients necessary to do what it needs to do. And at a certain point, then you need to start working on the proper balance of nutrients as well. Um, so I love Ryan's work. I think that he obviously disagrees um, partly with the train model and doesn't necessarily view toxicities as a problem, which I can understand by in his perspective, right? Because he's he's he says that in his observations, in his work, you know, he's not he's not seeing people get results from removing toxicities. I think the results of removing toxicities comes after you're well nourished. I think, I think that's a requirement. I think it's a requirement to be properly nourished physically, right? Because we can't necessarily ignore the physical body, right? So getting the proper physical nutrients is important. And obviously when you start supplementing and you start getting into this mindset of health, Everything kind of changed at the same time, right? You may start going outside, more grounding, you know, removing EMFs, things like this, right? So it's more than just health. But if you're if you're stuck in this in this state of disease, supplementation might be helpful, especially depending on where you're at. If you're in a city, if you don't have access to any high quality foods, or if you can't afford really high quality foods, it may be beneficial, right? So you really need to look at your situation honestly, truthfully, where are you at on your health journey? Everyone's in a different area. Now, when it comes to health optimization, is supplementation going to be the thing that gets you there? I don't think so, right? I think it's going to become an integration with nature, right? Getting closer to nature in every way. 
So that was a note that I wanted to make. Uh, I think the toxicity does come up too uh, in everybody in the form of acute illness. I think things like the seasonal flu is mostly due to electromagnetic, well, electromagnetic frequency has a large, large part of it, you know, and I do think that there are sources of toxicity that cause chronic diseases where it's a buildup of toxicity, but I think there's, there's two distinct areas here. And this is something that I want to decipher more moving forward is which diseases seem to be caused by toxicity, which seem to be caused by deficiency. Um, and we're definitely going to get into some super interesting discussions here where deficiencies actually lead to toxicities. And so you may have to address in a different manner, but everyone's health journey is different. That's another important thing to distinguish. So you need to take that into account. Yeah. And you know what? Like the episodes have been fantastic. Like I've said, they've been diverse. We're really pushing the terrain paradigm forward. Uh, Jacob Diaz and I's conversation was fantastic. I really enjoyed that one. You know, we started talking about parasites, microbes, pleomorphism is something that I really want to get into soon. I got a guest booked up here. We're probably going to talk about that a lot because uh, I think pleomorphism is super interesting, especially since we've overcomplicated health. We tend to overcomplicate solutions. Uh, so, you know, overcomplicating it can be beneficial for some people <laughs> before you can get back to the true simplicity of life. Yeah. And I mean, we finish off strong. Our Christmas episode with Kiera uh, was great. We talked about light EMF, uh, how they're both the same thing. <clears throat> they're both just frequency, right? On different, different spectrum. Uh, I love that conversation. Light health is something that I really want to get into more. Uh, something that, you know, you've half focus on, but prioritizing it, I think is something that's going to really benefit me. So, um, especially I'm a structured person. I like to have my structure and I think structuring in accordance to nature is, can be a very, very helpful thing. Um, especially in building your ego strength. All right. You look forward to, to the new discussions moving forward. I think it's, they're going to be super exciting. Like I, I am so happy with where the podcast is going so far. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to where it's going. So now I want to touch on, uh, some books that I read. My goal, I will accomplish two really good goals that I was really happy about that I'll share here. Two of my major goals. One of them was to read 12 books. I wanted to read one book per month. And my other goal was to start a podcast. So I accomplished both those goals. I read 16 books this year, which I'm pretty proud of, honestly. I know it's may seem minuscule, but for me, it's pretty good. Uh, and obviously, we're going to try and increase it this year. But uh, yeah, my favorite books, I got a few here that I've highlighted. Uh, I got this one, Moth and the Iron Lung. Fantastic, easy read, the biography of polio. Very good book. Forrest Moretti is a is fantastic um, author. He has a couple other books that I, I want to read as well. Uh, super good introductory book. Uh, if you don't like reading, because it's really easy to read and it's quite enjoyable. This one, if you want to delve a little deeper into Microzymas, The Blood and Its Third Element by Antoine Bichon. Obviously, the one of the founders, the visionaries of the train paradigm, uh, or at least the one who kept it alive. This is a great book, Microzymas. Um, great introductory book and the ideas of the deeper train theories. So. Then we got this one. This one's a little different. We have uh, Victor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. I thought this was a great book. I, a friend I went tree planting with recommended this book to me. Um, really amazing book about, about Victor Frankl was a Jew and survived the uh, Holocaust, right? So a really, really interesting perspective. Like a, such a beautiful book written, written very well. Enjoyable to read again. His insight is 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 unmatched. Amazing. Make you grateful, for sure. All right, and here we have the only book on finance. I read a couple finance books. Finance is something I want to talk about more uh, moving forward as well. I, I read Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, Your Invisible Power, the UCC Connection. That was uh, more just about knowledge on the way the states are set up. Uh, the Science of Getting Rich by Wallace Waddle, Waddles and Rich Dad, Poor Dad. All those books were fine. They were all decent. Rich that Poor Dad was pretty good. They all kind of tell the same story. Manifestation, visualization, all that stuff. 
the only book on finance you will ever have to read. The Richest Man in Babylon. This is the only book, George Clayson. Uh, this is the only book you'll ever have to read on finance. Read it, study it over and over and over again. Everything you know, everything you need to know about finances is in this book. You, um, you know, you don't need to be a billionaire. You don't need to be a millionaire, whatever. Uh, this book will help you out always. This was, oh, this was a fantastic book. The Invisible Rainbow, doozy of a book, but really good. Uh, again, a great introductory book getting into the train model. It's thick. It, it was a very enjoyable read. I really did enjoy reading this book. Uh, a lot of facts, a lot of scientific study, like, um, you know, a lot of scientific talk in it, right? But but I thought it was really good. It was really well written. Um, it wasn't necessarily difficult to understand either. I was organized well. Uh, and I have this book here, Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life. This is the Cell Biology Textbook. This is the Cell Biology Textbook. This is the book you need to read. This, and I got it up there, Fourth Phase of Water. Those two books, I didn't read that one this year. I read that one last year. But this book is is really, really amazing. So if you guys want to read this, you want to know about cell biology, read this book. Amazing. Gerald Pollack is, is, uh, is really on the forefront here. All right. And lastly, I have a book on psychology, How to Become a Schizophrenic, The Case Against Biological Psychiatry by John Modrow. Uh, this is a fantastic book. This is a topic that I'm going to be delving deeper in this year. Uh, psychology, right? And um, this is really a great introductory book. Enjoyable read. Talks about his um, his story. Talks about his a uh, lot about um, scientific scientific uh, literature as well, right? So it's it's what it's a well researched book as well, um, but very enjoyable read. If you are into psychology, I highly recommend that book. Uh, it's very important. And we're going to open up more about this and future works. I ordered some similar works that I'm going to get into and uh, bring you guys that. Uh, so this gets into kind of the podcast goals too, right? So obviously we're going to have more guests. I think it's going to be guest oriented for this year. Uh, I have obviously I have some ideas that I want to share of my own. You know, we'll see a lot of that on Instagram, social media. So that's part of my my goals as well is to stay consistent on social media. Uh, obviously increase my relationship with social media uh, because it can be challenging at times it can really suck you in but yeah I want to get uh, more guests on I want to talk to some virologists uh, microbiologists you know these modern thinkers right the, the people who kind of are taking on the modern perspective I really want to talk to them I really want to open up even though we disagree I'm really going to try hard to find people that disagree with me that want to talk to me because I feel like oh, <laughs> this might be a difficult challenge but Nevertheless, I'm going to try my best. I want to do that uh, because even if they could dismantle our arguments here, I think that's going to help us move forward in a better light too, right? Because we're going to increase the strength of our argument too. So um, even if we're left with just some some thoughts and some ideas that we, we get to research and move forward with, I think that'd be very helpful. And yeah, like I want to get into more topics too, like uh, really broaden the horizon here, like keep it in the respects of the train model where, you know, we're, we're taking responsibility for our own life. We're, we're looking at things from the root cause We're you know, we're, we're concerned with the outcome of the transformation we're doing, you know, so I really want to keep it in that respect, but you know, I want to move into some talks about finances. I want, I think that's an important thing that's, that's been ignored by, you know, the kind of spiritual community or even the health community, you know, they swear off finances as the devil, but it certainly doesn't have to be. Uh, it's all about your perspective and how you take on, how you look at it, right? But there's no sense going without, right? You know, you can be poor and be happy. You can be rich and be happy. Obviously, you can be rich and be corrupt. Uh, but you can be poor and be depressed. So really, you just get to choose. It's whatever you want. If you don't care about money, you don't want it, you don't need it. Who cares? And skip the episodes. <laughs> you know, like, it's up to you. If you're happy, that's what matters, right? That's what matters more. But the big point is that you don't have to go without. So why go without? That's kind of my way of thinking of it. All right. And so, you know, other topics that I want to get to is psychology. I That's um that's kind of my field. Uh, I know I talk, a, you know, uh, definitely a lot about health and, you know, uh, medical stuff. Healing stuff, I should say. But yeah, psychology, I think is super important. I think that 
sometimes it's beneficial to target the psyche rather than the body itself. Obviously, everything is connected. So it's really important to remember that, you know, everything goes hand in hand. So as I learn more about the body and as I learn more about biology and I learn more about the physical world, the more you learn about the metaphysical world as well, right? Because it's as above, so below, it's all connected. Uh, but psychology specifically is something I want to talk about a lot on this podcast, uh, which also ties into the idea of, you know, the, the field of uh, philosophy. I think that's a really important field too. And I think it goes hand in hand with science in general. Uh, we've lost our philosophical aspect of science. We don't use the logic. We don't use rationale. We don't use deductive reasoning. We don't use anything that's, we don't use our minds, right? I want to talk about that more. And, you know, we've already kind of talked about that a little bit now. It's kind of hard to avoid. <laughs> but, yeah, I guess now that you, we made it this far, I guess we'll go over a couple of little personal goals. Yeah, I mean, better light health is a big one for me. I, I want to increase my, my light health. I'm pretty good. You know, I'm pretty good. Get the dog out in the morning when the sun's coming up. Uh, where I struggle is is going to sleep, the screen time before bed. and. I'm going to start experiment with uh, blue light blockers. I don't think it's necessarily the entire answer, right? Minimizing is always best for minimizing the, the artificial lights for bed is, is better than blue light blockers. Blue light blockers might help if you are to be on screens before bed. So I want to experiment with that. Need some good brands to try out. Yeah, that's, that's a big one. Uh, decreasing electromagnetic frequencies as well is something that I've been doing in my house as a whole. That's, that's been going very well, but again, it's about minimizing. It's about spending more time in nature, spending more time grounded. Uh, I want to experiment uh, with grounding my house as well, like grounding my bed, see if we can hook up some copper to it and stick a, stick a pole outside and connect that up and see if we can a little ground in that way. That might be cool. It might be a cool experiment. I'll uh that'll probably be over on my social media. Uh you could probably follow along with that if I am successful, that is. Um maybe I'll post if I fail too. Why not? <laughs> Why not? We're not like these funders of the scientific studies where we only post positive findings, I guess. I guess I'll 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 just I'll show the progress. I'll show the progress. Yeah, I mean continuing on uh, you know, I have a lot of health related goals, obviously eat healthier, be healthier. That's always a goal. <laughs> so consistency is really something important here, right? Like I want to be more consistent and I think this is something everyone can work on, right? I think I mentioned this earlier, just be more consistent, you know, reading more during the day and, you know, maybe instead of going on your phone, you go on your, you just read a book or, you know, there's a lot of different ways to look at um, mewing is something that I'm focused on right now and that I want to continue on. Uh, I think that's amazing, right, for nose breathing. I want to also increase nose breathing and breath exercise. I think breath exercises is a really underrated uh, part of life as well, uh, often seen as a little woo-woo, but it, uh, I think there's really some strong, uh, there's really a strong uh, foundation for it being an extremely healthy thing. So. Yeah, that's, those are kind of part of my personal goals, right? So consistency, just, you know, being more consistent and uh, just better relationships in general, better relationship with social media. Uh, I've been consistent with the podcast so far, consistent with social media. Uh, so that's been lots of fun. Uh, I've really enjoyed that. And we're going to continue on with that. Like we're just getting started. I love it. Loved recording these podcast episodes. They're great. I like the solo episodes. They're fine. I like recording them. I don't know if you guys like them or not. Uh, I know this one was less formal. Um, so listen, guys, really appreciate some feedback on the solo episodes. If you guys like them, if you guys don't like them, I'll scrap them. I will keep the Instagram pretty well solo. It's kind of hard to buddy up on social media anyways. Uh, although you can do it a little bit. Uh, but yeah, guys, I guess this is we're kind of coming to the end. 2023 was a good year. 2024 is going to be even better. We're going to keep growing the social media. Hopefully, you know, we'll see where it goes. We got to kind of take it day by day too at the same time. You know, we can only plan so much. We just got to keep it rolling and, you know, see where it takes us. So it's been great so far, but we're going to keep it going. So I just, uh, that's great. All right. So we're at the time. We're at the conclusion. It's over. I want to thank you all for listening. 
Uh, everyone should know this is not medical advice, not scientific advice, not psychological advice. This is not advice in general. This is just information. This is just information. So <laughs> remember that. Uh, but, you know, like I said earlier, I can't change anybody's minds, really. It's really, really true, right? You only change your own mind. It takes looking into stuff, right? And you guys don't got to look into me. You can look into the books that I read. You can look, in, look into what you find interesting, right? If you follow your heart, you follow your intuition, you come to the truth. You know, you just got to look at what's interesting. and keep your, keep your mind open. Keep your mind open. Just remember, we're all responsible, sovereign beings capable of thinking, criticizing, understanding absolutely anything. This is really important to understand. Really important. We are all capable. We the people in the greater forces are together self healers, self governable, self teachers, and so much more. Please reach out to me if you have any comments, criticisms, concerns, questions, whatever. I'd love some feedback on these solo episodes. You know, I don't mind recording them at all. If you guys like them, we can keep doing them. If you guys like them and don't like them on the podcast, we can do them Instagram lives. We could do different ways. We could do it. Maybe Instagram Live would be good, so you guys could do maybe we could do more question and answer type stuff. Listen, guys, just reach out and let me know. Uh, I'm really open to to the feedback. I really love the feedback that I've gotten so far. I'm on Beyond Terrain on Instagram. That's the best place to get to me. And I really appreciate you guys listening. Like I really appreciate you guys listening so far into the podcast. People who've listened to every episode, even a few episodes here and there. Um, People follow me on social media, YouTube, whatever. You guys comment. You guys like it. That's that's amazing. I love it, guys. Like, thank you so much. You know, I really, really appreciate it. So give us a like. Give us a comment. Give us whatever. If you found it informative in any way, if you found it helpful, insightful, whatever, help us, help me, help me grow. Help us, help support me. That's the only thing I ask for. I, I'm not, I'm not going to be selling nothing on this podcast, I don't think, unless, unless it's my own, unless I've made it, unless I've, unless it's my, my own thing, but. Yeah, just just share, like, comment. And uh, just remember, there's two types of people in the world. Those who believe they can, those who believe they can't, and they are both correct. So you get to choose who you are. Thanks for listening, guys. Take care.